main speaker today uh, is Jason Porath. In a past life, he used to work on animated movies such as How to Train Your Dragon 2, The Croods, and Kung Fu Panda 2. I should get my four-year-old in here because he'll absolutely love that. <laughs> In 2014, he left the film industry to start Rejected Princesses, a blog turned book series that celebrates the lives of little known women with thoroughly researched and illustrated histories of their lives. He lives in LA where he works on screenplays and novels in between singing and a lot of karaoke. He'll be speaking to us on the history sensation of nonviolence. Please welcome to the screen, Jason Perrault. Hi, everybody. Uh, cool. I'm going to share my screen because I got a whole presentation uh, ready to roll. Let me see here. All right. I hope you all can see that. Uh, cool. Uh, hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jason. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, a lot of history stuff, um, primarily uh, sort of the sanitization of, of nonviolence, how nonviolence has been portrayed in, in kind of history books. Um, we'll get there. Uh, I'm actually going to start somewhere else. I'm going to start with uh, someone who's near and dear to my heart, and I think uh, you know, hopefully many of yours, Joan of Arc. So Joan of Arc is a story that I think we all learned about in school. A 19-year-old girl comes from the far reaches of France and uh, uh, leads their armies to victory, sort of ends the uh, 100-year war, kicks the British out of France. Hooray, this is historical. It's actually happened. It's an amazing story. It also makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, who in their right mind would let the 19-year-old girl in to see the King of France, let alone put her in charge of the army? Uh, the answer to this actually makes the entire story make a whole lot more sense, uh, even though it's not often put into uh, sort of how her story is told. The answer is Yolande of Aragon, uh, who was the uh, King of France's mother-in-law, uh, King of France at the time being Charles VII. Yolande of Aragon is one of these figures in history who's like, kind of little known, she, best we can tell, kind of operated in the shadows kind of person. So there's really, there's a lot of details of her life here that it's like, um, but uh, best we can tell, uh, this is the, the going theory. Uh, there's obviously many of them because history, but this is the one that, that I, I find most likely. Um, she had a army ready to roll uh, to kick out the, the British. Again, this has been going on for about a hundred years at this point, um, this fight. And she had, a son-in-law who was supposed to like lead the uh, uh, armies, except he was extremely dispirited. Uh, he's just like, oh, I can't do anything. I just need a sign from God. And so she made one. Uh, she was uh, in charge of a region of France that was uh, known for its minstrels, its bards. And so very mysteriously, uh, around this time, this legend started popping up with all the bards singing it uh, about uh, how there was going to be some girl coming from the far reaches of France, a, a peasant girl who was going to lead them to victory. About 35 girls showed up. She changed the tone. The whole thing was basically like a 14th century help wanted ad. Uh, so all this makes this uh, make a, a lot more sense. Um, but the thing that, that it still doesn't quite get to in all of this uh, is the character of Joan of Arc herself, who I think generally as portrayed uh, in a lot of the history books, at least the way I learned about it, was, was a little sanitized. Uh, in reality, she was kind of a, a brutal warlord that everybody was kind of terrified of. Uh, she was really good at cannon warfare. Uh, and that sort of gets left out of, of a lot of the portrayals of her. Like the people would surrender rather than go up to her in battle because she was just terrifying to them. Um, so I, I really like that sort of twin aspect of like her being this, this holy, uh, sort of revered martyr figure, but also a terrifying warlord. Uh, so, uh, I, in my work sort of marry these, these sorts of very incongruous concepts. So I illustrated her as this, as sort of like, what if she was a Disney princess, right? And there's uh, some of the angels that she's uh, purported to uh, have seen in her life. Uh, and uh, there's uh, Yolanda Varagon there hanging out in the background. Um, this is the sort of work that I do under the heading of uh, Rejected Princesses, uh, where I, I gather women that um, you haven't heard of, or if you have heard of them, there's stuff that you, you really don't know but should about them that sort of fleshes them out as people. Uh, it's not like purely good, purely bad, but like an interesting mix of, of all of the above. Uh, some of the people that I have here is uh, 
uh, Mochizuki Chiyome, who is a, um, a Japanese woman who, a uh, kindly old lady who ran an orphanage for, uh, is at the time of war, there were a lot of widows and prostitutes, orphans, she took all of them in and uh, made it into a secret ninja academy and had like the largest spy army in uh, possibly the world at the time. Um, Rani Lakshmi Bai, who we'll get to uh, later in, in this, but uh, led an armed uprising against the British uh, in India in 1857 with a baby strapped to her back. Joan of Arc, uh, you know, and then Ana Lezema de Orinza, who uh, semi-mythical uh, Bolivian lesbian teenage vigilante, kind of um, Batman, basically. Um, Anyways, this is uh, the project I do, but it's not what I've always done. Uh, prior to doing Princesses, I was, uh, I worked at DreamWorks. Uh, I was not a, a animator as people would generally think of them. I would like draw stuff. I was like a physics animator. I would do like all the, the liquid simulations. Like this is a shot from the end of Shrek 4, I think, uh, where uh, they were like moving a lot of mud and I had to do all the physics calculations for that. Uh, so I was a very strange kind of, of animator. I didn't know how to draw. I kind of taught myself over the, my time there. Um, and all that kind of started shifting when this movie came out. Um, when Frozen came out, it kind of sucked all the air out of the room. Uh, it's all anybody could uh, talk about. Every website out there was putting up different articles because people would click on them. So there were tons of articles sort of being passed around work uh, here and there uh, about this. Uh, but one that really like stuck with us was uh, uh, one of those uh, 12 reasons the Frozen girls are bad role models or something like that. Uh, and so I brought it up at lunch and we basically just, just shot the shit. We were like, uh, you know, if they're bad role models, we can come up with way worse ones. Like, what's the worst idea for a Disney princess you can think of? And at that lunch table meeting, like, uh, we were just trying to, to one-up each other. The worst one we came up with was Nabokov's Lolita uh, as a Disney princess, which is a truly terrible idea. Uh, it made me laugh, but it's a truly terrible idea. Um, but some of the ones that I tossed out there were just, like, I was a Wikipedia junkie, and, uh, God, there we go, uh, that uh, I, I would... Uh, toss out ones that nobody at the table had heard of, like uh, Boudicca, uh, who is a uh, first century uh, proto-Celtic uh, woman who, when her, her husband was killed and her daughter, daughters were uh, ravaged, she led a, a, a force against the Romans that ended up killing uh, 70 to 80,000 Romans and burning uh, what would become London to the ground. Uh, it was a town called Londinium at the time. Um, or Jingam Bande, who's uh, credited as the mother of Angola, led a guerrilla warfare campaign against uh, the Portuguese for 35 to 40 years. Uh, just just a, a fierce, amazing uh, human being. Nobody at the table had heard of them. So like, I, I was just like, oh, wouldn't it be cool? But I, I went back to work. It wasn't until the last movie that I worked on there that I, I really started shifting my point of view on this a lot. Um, and that was uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2. Um, spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen it. I'm sorry I'm about to spoil a, a several years old movie at this point, but um, so the How to Train Your Dragon franchise, um, at the time we, there was just the, the, the one and we were working on the second, um, but far and away the most popular character to cosplay, at least from the first one, uh, was uh, Astrid, the, the sort of love interest Viking who is portrayed the first shot she shows up in, she's walking away from an explosion, she's the most competent character there, right? And in the second one, she gets relegated to this sort of girlfriend role. This upset me. Uh, this upset me a lot because it was it was sort of like shifting away from like a, a a more nuanced, interesting look at her, and she just becomes sort of this bowdlerized character. But what upset me more um, was the portrayal of uh, a new character uh, whose name was Velka, uh, who is the long lost missing mom of, of the main character. Um, the way that Velka was portrayed shifted throughout production and that uh, it, with it, it shifted the entire tone of the movie. Uh, the movie as was released was different than the movie that, as it was conceived. The movie as it was originally conceived was Empire Strikes Back. Now, follow me here. Both characters have uh, lightsabers. Uh, they are missing limbs and have artificial ones that they put together them, uh, themselves. In the first one, they blow up the Death Star. In the second one, they blow up a nearly identical Death Star. Uh, characters ride X-Wings. Luke, I am your mother. She was supposed to be Darth Vader. She was not. If you've seen the movie or the third one, you'll know that she's 
she shows up and there's a little bit of like confusion, maybe like five minutes of hurt feelings of like, hey, where have you been for the past 18 years? But then she's just a, a genuinely good character and they never get into it. She never gets any of the emotional depth or complexity uh, that you get with a Darth Vader. And I, 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 I went to the, the heads of the studio, I'm like, she was so much more interesting when she was this Jane Goodall eco-terrorist that wants to free all the dragons and you had legitimate conflict. Why did we have to change that? And they're just like, uh, we didn't think it would test well with moms. We wanted something that was more simple to digest. It's a kid's movie. We just want generic good and evil, generic good and evil. It's just easier this way. And that upset me. Uh, and I, I, I was already planning to leave the studio, but I did uh, after that movie. And uh, a lot of what I, I did um, in the wake of that, that this was sort of inspired by that, was invest, like doing this, this rejected princesses thing where I, I, I dive into uh, the stories of historical women. But uh, as I started doing this, and I am not a historian by training, I, 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 again, was sort of a physics programmer. Um, I really wanted to dive into these, these characteristics that I saw time and time again kind of simplified, censored, just put into camps of good and evil. I want, really wanted to dive into stuff that I felt was missing from history class, that like history class would be really boring of like, it's just facts and figures and like these care, the people are not relatable. They're like these ivory tower people. So I'd look into it and, and try and portray them in all the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, so you'd take someone like Harriet Tubman and at the time, Harriet Tubman was sort of just this, uh, portrayed as this kindly lady who freed people from, from slavery. It wasn't until a drunk history rolled around, I, I would argue, that people started seeing her as like, no, she was an arsonist spy master for the Union. Um, there's actually a story that um, it's impossible to verify, but it shows up in a couple of, of the biographies of her. Um, where she's not, the, the reason that she's, you never see her smiling in any of her photos, such the biography claims, is that she doesn't have any front teeth. And she doesn't have any front teeth because at one point on one of her missions, she had a mouth infection. And instead of uh, endangering the mission by going in to get a fix, she took the back end of her gun and knocked out her own teeth, which is just nuts. That is not the image of, of Harriet Tubman that I grew up with. That is, that is some action hero stuff. Uh, and like, she's got good and bad. She definitely like, like had some, some, some crazy, like out there visions and like, she was a more complex character than I was getting portrayed. Similarly, Amelia Earhart, aviatrix, daredevil, amazing human being. Also polyamorous libertine who is in an open marriage. Uh, it, her contract with her husband basically said, look, I'm going to try and be faithful, but let's be honest, I'm Amelia Earhart and you're Amelia Earhart's husband, so it might not happen. Um, but the one that got me more than any of them um, was Helen Keller. Uh, Helen Keller is what uh, one of my friends referred to as uh, inspiration porn, uh, especially as, as portrayed by like the, the Disney versions or the, the miracle worker and whatnot. It's just, here's an inspirational story of someone overcoming adversity, yada, yada, yada. And it cuts off like before she becomes an adult. So you get this version of Helen Keller. You don't get this version of Helen Keller because when she became an adult, she became an outspoken activist, socialist, arguably communist, uh, and was did not mince words. <laughs> like she she was not a fan of, of war. She was, she was definitely leftist and outspoken and uh, Basically, they, they, they wanted her to get talk, like, they were very into her when she was, she was starting to talk, and then once she started talking, they just wanted her to shut up. Um, she would show up to uh, protests and whatnot, and like, this is just not the picture of her that I, I got in my books. It was, it was this very slim sliver of like, oh, she's a, a good person, and like, they, 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 there's no depth to her, there's no complexity. Um, and similarly, like, a lot of these I started seeing that a lot of these uh, movements also had similar ways of being portrayed. So uh, she was a, a big into sort of a women's suffrage and then labor stuff. And the image of, of the suffrage movement, I think that largely I got at least in school, and I think the, the way that it's largely portrayed are these women with the signs and the purple sashes, and it's, it's very like wave for the camera when 
in reality, it was rightly kind of two movements. This right here is sort of the, the US movement that suffragists. The UK movement, which had this definitely, the sort of uh, peaceful wave for the camera, also I think was more notably had the suffragettes uh, who were, I think it is fair to say, homegrown terrorists. They would uh, bomb things, uh, they would fight the cops, um, like literally, they, they, they had their own uh, version of uh, jujitsu that they, they learned to do called suffragitsu. Uh, they would carry around billy clubs and, and get into uh, tussles with the police. Um, there's a woman named Edith Garrod uh, who trained a 30 woman strong um, uh, bodyguard squad for Emmeline Pankhurst, who was sort of uh, the, the head of, of, of their group. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, so she had a, what they called um, a Pankhurst Amazons, I think is what they called them. Um, and the the news media at the time was was kind of a Twitter about them, it was like 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 afraid, like portraying them in, in tremendously unfavorable terms, understandably. Um, but the that sort of thing gets gets whittled down, censored. So you have like the suffragists who are the good ones and then you have the suffragettes who are the bad ones and you sort of leave it at that and you don't go into the complexity of like, well, why were, were these people doing like, like the, the suffragettes were, were rare, they would never like pick a fight with the cops. They would, they would uh, fight in, in defense. They would destroy property, but they, they wouldn't instigate uh, uh, violence. Why were they doing this? Well, uh, there was like, there, their treatment when they, they were speaking out and they were doing these these sort of uh, nonviolent protests were horrifying and it, it radicalized them. They would be force fed, they would be uh, beaten, they would be imprisoned, they would be put into mental asylums that were like tremendously unsanitary uh, and nobody really cared. Uh, and so it, it radicalized a lot of them and they're just like, we're not playing by these rules anymore. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst was actually famous for uh, going around, uh, she would do, whenever she was in prison, she was imprisoned a lot. Uh, she would do these combination hunger, sleep, and uh, thirst strikes where she just wouldn't eat or drink anything and she would wander around with her arm above her head so that she wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Uh, the WSPU, uh, was the, the, the group that she was with, actually had its own ambulance to transport her around. And yet, a lot of the way that the, the movements were portrayed was you have the, the good ones who are, are nice, nonviolent, and, and prim and proper, wave for the camera, and then you have the, the violent ones who just are these, these shrews that are constantly demanding more and more and more. Um, they're often portrayed as, as uh, kind of ugly. They're, uh, yeah, it was, it was, shall we say, uncharitable interpretations. Um, and you see this with other social movements as well. You have Gandhi, Gandhi's the good one. The bad one is Rani Lakshmibai or any of the, the many, many decades, arguably a century of armed rebellion against the, uh, uh, the British government that, that came beforehand. That's the bad one and Gandhi's the good one. But at the time, Gandhi was portrayed uh, as part and parcel of that. It wasn't necessarily portrayed as there wasn't this this quite this distinction, right? And and it was constantly like he was being tarred with this this implication of violence, right? So you have your political cartoon where India, the entire nation itself, is is portrayed as this woman that's uh, holding a child and is as at danger, and everybody else is just uh, blithely leaving her to. Uh, violence, which is sort of uh, thought to be, okay, this is the natural state, this is like they're, they're knocking down all of, all, all of the order and this is what it's going to descend into. You see this over and over again, it's like that this is constantly like tarring these nonviolent movements that now we see as like legitimate and like, like saintly, but they're like, oh no, they're violent, you, you don't know what they're going to lead to. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Is, is a very direct line of that. Like he, you can see him there with the, the portrait of Gandhi. That is very intentional on his part. Um, but then he's the sort of flip side here is he's, he's the good one and Malcolm X is the bad one. When in reality, they were kind of, you, you can't have one without the other. This is, and here's where I'm going out on, on a little bit of a, a limb here, right? I do a lot of deep dives into history. I'm not like a, a historian by training. I don't have like the, the, the broad, like study absolutely everything. I do like, here's an interesting person. I'm going to dive deep on this, dive deep on that, dive deep on that. 
So this is basically my thinking from having done a ton of deep dives, enough deep dives, and like follow different rabbit holes where they lead to to come to this idea that, and this is just something I'm, I'm tossing out there, but I, I, I believe this is true that you nonviolent movements usually are not successful unless there is a, a, a violent movement attached to them. When you have purely nonviolent movements, oftentimes they're they're quashed by sort of authoritarian things and, and whatnot. You, the, the, the violent part of these movements are part and parcel of it to make the nonviolent one the good one by being the bad one. Um, and the Malcolm X school of thought, the, the Black Panthers were unambiguously at the time, the bad one. I think are to this day are sort of considered the bad one. Um, like in, in, I think this is 1857, the uh, Black Panthers uh, went into the uh, state capitol at um, Sacramento uh, and just stood there with guns, just saying, hey, we're here, we have guns. And uh, people were, were freaked out and passed gun legislation uh, pretty much immediately after. I mean, people were, were legit scared of them in the same way that people were legit scared of, of the, uh, the suffragettes, the legit scared of, of other stuff. So it made King look better. But even at the time, there was a lot of, of attempt to say, no, they're, they're part and parcel of the same thing, like, and tie him to it. It's just like, oh, they're, they're ignoring and they, they, you can see these uh, cartoons where you, you, you have, it's like, oh yeah, he's, he's preaching nonviolence, but he's not. Uh, it's, it's, it's blithely ignoring what the, the reality of it is. Like it's, it's, it's which is not, I, I don't think how it's seen historically, but at the time people were trying to kind of uh, paint him with that brush. Uh, you can see it in this cartoon, right? It's like, I plan to lead another nonviolent march tomorrow. Like, I don't know about you, but this feels like a really contemporary cartoon to me. Like I could see something like this. You, you swap out like, who is standing there in place of, of MLK, that could be in the paper today, right? Um, and like, you, you, this is like, I, I did some digging on this and, and found out that uh, people actually sent him this and like scribbled on this. It's hard to read, so I, I, I wrote it up there. Um, this is best I can I could tell. Is that how can you, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, be such a deceitful hypocrite? You're not fooling anyone but yourself, and you're nauseating talk about nonviolence. You demand a program to overcome poverty and blow in untold amounts in your high living and running all over the globe to feed your own egotism. That feels really contemporary to me, right? And it it feels like a like there's no separation. There's no understanding of the complexity of a situation, everything is just good or bad, and you point, paint them with one brush or the other. Um, and there were concerted efforts to tie him to things that other people would like, wouldn't like, when like it became more evident that his, his message of, of civil rights was, was really picking up and getting a, a more uh, press, and, and people were generally in favor of it, he was starting to get tied to the anti-Vietnam stuff, which uh, was less popular. So like, in the same way that, uh, like I, I, I see echoes of this of like, oh, Black Lives Matter, tying it to like being a Marxist organization, right? Like they're, they're kind of not the same thing, but you, you get them sort of uh, mixed in. Like it feels like these are just echoes of things happening throughout. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, and I see this like with, with social movements and revolutions all over, like the, the gay rights movement had to have Stonewall. Like it, 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 it was there before, but Stonewall really picked it up. Um, and yes, I, I cover Marsha P. Johnson in, in one of my books. Um, the Egyptian re revolution in 1919, this is largely seen as a, a nonviolent revolution. However, there was a, a largely violent component that was put down by uh, sort of World War troops from uh, weirdly enough, Australia was, was a lot of the troops that, that were doing it. Uh, they just happened to be there at the time. Um, uh, Tobago uh, and Trinidad uh, had uh, are, are viewed as kind of a nonviolent uh, emancipation of like how they, they freed the slaves. Like they they petitioned for it, they petitioned for it, and it, they 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 got their freedom. It was great, uh, but it, that kind of ignores the decades of violent revolts that had led to that, like decades and decades and decades of this. 
um, that made it the more palatable alternative that where you were able to separate like, oh, that's the good one, that's the bad one. Um, but Trinidad and Tobago remember this. They remember both sides of it. They celebrate both sides of it. That's a reenactment on, on the, the right. The, to my understanding, they do this on, on the regular as part of their uh, Emancipation Day uh, celebration so that they, they remember both sides in the same way that we would remember like in the States, like the, uh, like the War for Independence, right? Um, they they wrestle with with both sides of it. Not not every country wrestles with with absolutely everything, but I would argue that there's uh, a a lack of wrestling with certain parts of of uh, American past and just portraying them as just good or bad. And like all countries do this, to be sure, uh, that is is not serving us particularly well. Um, similarly, you have. Uh, Korea, that's the March 1st movement. This was the uh, uh, one of the, uh, possibly the first big nonviolent movement that actually inspired Gandhi. Uh, they were trying to get the, uh, the Japanese out uh, when the uh, Japanese were, were uh, had basically invaded and, and were running Korea. Um, and there was largely nonviolent movement to that. And that's what a lot of the history books remember. But Korea also remembers all the, the violent uprisings, all the guerrilla warfare and the, the the fights that they had. This is a fairly big budget movie that came out just last year that's about one of those fights. And yes, it's it's easy to have like that when you're you have a a enemy that is is another nation, but still remembering both sides of of how things went, I think is important. Um where I think a, a lot of this like comes down to the, the, the changing point for how we were, we were remembering a lot of this stuff. Um, the one that stands out to me, at least, there, there are a lot of them, but the, the uh, labor movement, and this is coming right before Labor Day, so it's on my mind, but uh, I think the way that I got it growing up and the way I think a, a lot of us got it growing up were these, these images of uh, the labor movement being uh, people going on, on strike and holding up signs and whatever, and it sort of ignores a lot of the like bigger moments of it, uh, like the, the Haymarket riots, which I, I learned about in, in passing, but I didn't really understand the full scale of like police brutality and, and uh, uh, protesters bombing things, assassinations. Like it was, it was crazy, the, like, the, the scale of um, uh, people going to, to court and being run through kangaroo courts and whatnot. Like, I, it's it's a messy, complicated thing where there's not a lot of like necessarily good people that people get to radicalize. It's an important moment in, in U.S. history that's sort of given short shrift, especially when compared to stuff that is more unambiguously good versus evil, like World War II or World War One, right? Um, similarly, like uh, the the Ludlow massacre, which I never heard about in school, is this. Uh, huge moment in, in U.S. labor history where the um, Rockefeller and uh, uh, I believe in, in concert with uh, the National Guard go in and uh, uh, just kill a bunch of strikers, including uh, women and children in this uh, uh, tent city, which to me evokes like all of these uh, images of like where people are setting up uh, uh, little tent cities for protests, uh, even nowadays, like um, Occupy Wall Street or whatever. They go in and they literally kill all of them. And it's, uh, well, not all of them, but like a, a good 20 some odd. Uh, and it, it really turns the tide of, of opinion against them. What, what changes about this afterwards is that Rockefeller sees the tide of opinion turning against him. And this is again, like around 100 years ago. Um, and he hires a dude named Ivy Lee, uh, who kind of uh, makes the first stab at modern PR. And so there's a lot of pictures of, of Rockefeller going around handing out dimes to kids at, in the wake of this to sort of rehabilitate his image and like look at him being a, a you know a, a nice dude who gives back to the community, et cetera. Like this was this is a tactic, and it it evolved and it it changed form and and you start seeing uh, what works and what doesn't and and the the stories start changing and it's not like the, the Ludlow massacre had a ton of nuance to the reporting as it was um, but you know it, it was at least getting out uh, that side and then people were, were able to argue the other side but you start seeing things that again feel fairly contemporary or just like one-sided like look at all this this property violence look at all this uh, whereas like just a, a scant 
like a couple of years before it was uh you know you'd see the sides of the, the strikers as well it, it, it becomes like you're separating things out into good and bad and you're 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 losing all of the the middle ground um and you're not seeing uh sort of where people are coming from um and i just see this more and more and more like people are like the PR has sort of evolved from newspaper articles down to memes that can be shared everywhere and everything gets just boiled down into its its most like emotional yellow journalism components and it's it's not great to see. Um, I'd much rather that we have um, deeper dives and looks into people with all their their messy complexity and uh, see what they were fighting for and why they were they were they, uh, the way they were uh, and uh, all the stuff that they did that was good and bad and rate them on that as opposed to just lumping them in as this is the good one this is the bad one anyways that's that's what my work is about uh, I hope you enjoyed I hope I didn't go too far out on a limb there um, thanks for listening let me stop just sharing my screen if I can figure out where my mouse is I cannot figure out where my mouse is there we are. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I, I have to say, as um, someone who's not going to admit how many times they've watched the How to Train Your Dragons movies um, in general, I, I kind of kept waiting for a twist with Hiccup's mom um, that never came. So I, I think you were probably right on the money with, <laughs> with having a more complex character there. Um, but uh, kids still like it so <laughs> all right well um thank you so much um before we go to uh q a we are going to come back for a q a session after this uh we'll break out into discussion groups you can hit join if you want to join now if not you can um hit not right now and come back to it later so if you want to step away get some coffee run to the bathroom um you can do that um but in the breakout rooms you can use this time Say hello to other Oasins, uh, think up some questions uh, for Jason when we get back. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, uh, this is a great time to post your questions to the comment section and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. All right, welcome back everybody. I hope you all had great discussions. Uh, we are gonna open up uh, to anyone with questions or uh, mention an idea that your breakout room came up with. Uh, as always, we wanna keep questions and comments brief so we can get to as many as possible. Um, I do want to start with one of the comments that came in the chat room from Richard, um, who, this is kind of more of a comment, I guess, but um, for you, Jason, that uh, social movements with a nonviolent component seem to be most successful when an initially skeptical public is won over by completely non-intuitive methods. So photos and TV scenes of fire hoses and beatings being wielded against uh, disciplined and organized nonviolent civil rights protesters were extremely powerful. Um, the language employed, uh, especially with uh, MLK's I Have a Dream speech, was an audio piece, um, and, and that influenced a lot of white Americans who had previously not been paying attention. Uh, I mean, my reaction to that is, like, yes, when, when you say non-intuitive methods, and the, I, I would characterize that sort of um, the fire hoses and whatnot as, as um, being the underdog, uh, I think that there's there's a race to be the underdog, uh, kind of on all sides, uh, to be the one that is is put upon and the one that uh, is fighting against the, the tyranny or, or or what have you. I think that 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 was what was, what is has traditionally been very effective in in swaying um, public opinion. I w I would argue more so than appeals to love and whatnot, because if if you have that, then hippies would be running the world. And um, yeah, <laughs> like Marion Williamson would be topping the polls. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat windows, either on Facebook or here. Uh, does anyone have a question they wanna ask uh, verbally? You do just kind of raise your make hand. A comment? May I make yes. a comment? Go ahead, Susan. What, one thing that is currently happening is that there's uh, that, that nonviolent protests are starting to get a really bad um, image, uh, mixed up, mixed up with 
the, with the bad stuff. And I don't know what's going on, but it's certainly worth watching carefully. And the other thing that I have been one thinking about for a long time is that the ease with which, um, you know, friends and family, uh, everybody s says, oh, you don't like something? Well, you, well, you have a chance to vote, you know, next time, which is a long time between disgruntlement, you know, and disagreement with what, what, with what's currently going on. Those are two separate ide ide ideas. But the idea that, you know, well, sure we have a, sure we have a way to, to solve these problems. All you have to do is wait and sign up and vote when the time comes. I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, uh, it, I, I, I believe it to be, like in my point of view, it is a PR tactic to tar current nonviolent protests with the same brush as the violent ones. And I think it's the same thing that you saw with MLK. It's the same thing you've seen kind of all over. And I, 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 if I had to draw a, a line historically, I'd draw it back to Rockefeller and the birth of, of modern PR um, to where everything just sort of you you don't get any sort of distinction. Everything is, is good or bad. And there's I when mean, you're not splitting them into two and you're just painting everything with the bad brush, then that's that's what you get. That's my point of view at least. Do we have any other questions or comments? All right, Samia. Yeah. Hi there, Jason. Good morning, and thank you for a magnificent presentation. Uh, we want to hear so much more from you. Uh, I really appreciated you pulling the balance thread uh, of, of, of the violent, nonviolent internationally, because America is certainly not the only uh, seed with violent, nonviolent, right? But you're a student of history more than I am. So I'd like you possibly to maybe go back in history and see where these things have brought their societies. And in essence, I'm asking of you to look at the history and then what do you see in the future of the United States given those historical uh, seed parameters? Okay. Um... I'll, I'll, I'll uh, first address your, 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 what I think you were getting at with, with some of the international stuff. Um, there are instances in other, other countries and other cultures where what would, at least from a historical perspective, seem to be purely nonviolent movements were successful. These were largely civilizations and cultures that were non-Western um, or were, so I'm, I'm primarily thinking of Africa, actually. Like it's, it's, it's primarily when I, I think of this, I think of uh, a, a woman named Nguan Yarua, I'm probably mispronouncing the name, I've only ever seen it written, uh, who uh, started what it was referred to as the Abba's Women's Riot or the Igbo Women's War, um, which was a, a protestation against uh, taxation that was Nonviolent and successful. Similarly, um, oh, Ransom Kuti, who's uh, the mother of, of Fela Kuti, uh, the musician. Um, I think that's what she's, she's best for, known for nowadays, but honestly, is, is uh, on a global scale the, the equal of any MLK or, or Gandhi. Um, a nonviolent protester uh, who, who uh, inspired a, a wave of, of such movements across uh, Africa. Um, also like was successful and you see this also a little bit with with New Zealand um, and New Zealand uh, there there were uh, holdings this is my understanding and I'm, I'm this is this is I'm going a little bit out on memory so I could have some of the details wrong on this um, that Samoa ad agitated for independence and the New Zealand part of it the, the New Zealand controlled part of Samoa was just like 
you know, well argued. We see what you're, you're saying. Go, go forth and, and be independent. The American side brought in Hawaiian folk um, to basically sway opinion and, and muddy the waters. Uh, Hawaii having just sort of lost its, its movement for independence in, in the U.S. And so there's what continues to be American Samoa. So I don't know. I, I, I have trouble not not knowing enough about like the the cultural characteristics of of those cultures to draw a line of like this is this is the the lever that is different between those um if i had to guess it would be something related to sort of uh cultural shame and cultural like um uh like the 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 lever of shame too oh, to, but i don't know uh that that that's me going way out on a limb um, as for trajectory of the U.S., not great, not great. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't think more. in good places. I'm sorry. Tell me more. <laughs> I'm just going to get real depressed. <laughs> well, before you, we get you really depressed, um, let's go on to the next question. I think uh, Jeff and Brenda, did you all have a question? No, uh, I I was just thinking that um, the what we're doing here is is a good example of social evolution. You know, uh, uh, seeing things that we believe to be true and 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 seeing the truth of it now. I mean, it's it's uh, how how we progress. And you know, I, that's just a comment I made. I uh, I, I was thinking. That's it. Gotcha. All right. Uh, CB had a question. CB, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. My question is part comment, uh, but people forget I'm old. And I was in Chicago as an adult for the Martin Luther King riots, the ones that followed his assassination. And I am of the opinion, and also have a question, I think it takes violence to get through the nonviolent movement, to get people's attention. Uh, you know, in every case that I can remember, and look at what's happening in Belarus today. Are you following that, Jason? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. You know, they have a nonviolent protest. But it was the violence against the protesters that's got the international attention. So yep. I think they're hand in glove. And I sort of picked that up against you about your talk. Is that true? Yeah, I pick it up correctly. I mean, that's, that's I, and I, again, I, I preface it in the talk of like, this is me going out a little bit on a limb. Like I do deep dives as opposed to a broad overview of history, a uh, broad survey. I tend to agree. Um, because the non the violent stuff lets the the nonviolence be the palatable alternative. Um, when you have a nonviolent protest with no violent component, it can be quashed and often is and and or is is overshadowed. Like when you don't don't address the nonviolent component, don't don't say okay, we're going to canonize this as is a good one if, if, if you're in, in cases where they're they're all castigated as bad and and and, and quashed you it leads to really like autocratic like stuff like the Arab Spring um, where where there were a lot of nonviolent protests but then they kept getting crushed and crushed and crushed and it it radicalized everybody and, and turned them all violent which is very bad um, I, I believe that in 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 most cases at least in 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 Western countries that as, as I have studied, um, having a violent component to a movement to allow the nonviolent component to be the palatable alternative is a key component. There are isolated instances where that's not the case, but I would argue there are exceptions to the rule. Thank you. Um, Robert on Facebook uh, thinks your holistic stories uh, should be underground animated films. Just for that. <laughs> um, 
but uh, next question we have, uh, does the simplification of good and evil in virtually all of America, uh, like American movies, have an influence on or is a reason for the current political status of hate and distrust? I mean, it certainly help. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's not the only thing for sure, but uh, it's certainly, I don't know, it's, uh, it feels to me, and again, this is like personal thought going out on, on limbs. Um, it feels to me like this oversimplification is, is this sort of childish thinking where everything kind of gets boiled down to this common denominator that can make it across like a, a, a wide spectrum of people that can and hit the, the widest possible audience as opposed to something with more nuance that, that slowly over time, the nuance has been kind of baked out of like the, the popular discourse um, and, and media and whatnot. And that's a shame. It feels like we're like all movies are aimed at the, the PG-13 crowd and all media is kind of aimed at, like it never gets to a higher echelon of, of discussion. Maybe that's me being <laughs> the old man, but that's sort of where my mind is on that. Okay. Great. Um, another question, um, and I'm trying to get through as many as possible, um, but uh, what do you think the difference is between glorified violent protests like the, the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution and the vilification of violence in response to police brutality that's happening now? Is it simply a matter of the victors being the ones to write history or is there something more to it? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. At the time the Boston Tea Party, I'm sure, was was not exactly heralded as a, a wonderful thing in, in uh, you know, the gazettes and uh, overseas and whatnot. It was probably like, oh my God, look at those violent colonials. Um, you know, it, it really is a long view of history and you, you start seeing where it bends. All right. Um, Eric asks if there are any major film producers that you believe would be willing to produce more historical accounts like the ones you've presented. Uh, that, and where do you go after stepping away from DreamWorks? Uh, I already stepped away in 2014 <laughs> to DreamWorks since then. Um, I, producers, there's always people who want to do this. That's the thing is like Hollywood is full of people with like good hearts, good intentions, et cetera, but getting things made is hellish. Like, like it just, it, it takes forever. I sold the, the film TV rights to a very major name person who I, I firmly believe in their ability to get things made two and a half, three years ago, and nothing has come of it. Uh, they, they haven't tried. It's just, it's, and I got, I got no leverage there. So um, when the one thing that I, I know more than anything is that when one movie does well, there's going to be a million movies that copy it. So when I, I was working on Dragons 2, right, one of the things that I, I, I railed against was um, at the end of the movie, uh, Hiccup, the main character, the dude, is made chief, and that's just the wrong move. He should not have been chief. It should have been Astrid, 100%. Everybody on the production agreed. We were told girls can't be chiefs. It's a boys' movie. It's an action movie. Like, literally, this is the words I got from the bean counter. Uh, I think the next year Moana came out. Uh, and Moana did really great. And Moana is, is like this, Moana was a bet. Moana was not a safe movie for them to make. It is a, a, a all brown person cast, uh, entirely earth palette tones going up, like I think same opening weekend against Trolls, which is like a bubblegum rainbow nightmare. Uh, and like, uh, it was a, a, a songs in a language that like 10,000 people on earth speak. It was very, like no cultural touch base. Like it was a risky movie for them to make. Uh, and the main character was a woman who unambiguously was chief. And it was just like, oh no, that's just how it is. And nobody gave a shit. And Moana did really well. And so you start seeing that pick up more and more. So when one historical movie does well, there will be more that follow. Problem is that a lot of these historical movies are terrible. 
uh, there was one that came out a little bit ago called Suffragette that I really wanted to be good because like, oh my God, it was finally like dealing with like how hardcore the Suffragette movement was. And it was, no, nah, it wasn't, it wasn't good. It was like a B minus movie. It didn't get into like the real nitty gritty of it. I had Meryl Streep as Emily and Pankhurst and screwed that up. How can you screw that up? Oh, I was so mad. Um, there's people who want to get it made. The key to get it made is just for anything that is similar that the bean counters would just look at as like, oh, well, it's the same genre and it's the same whatever. Like uh, when they feed it into the machine, it will be similar enough to be like, oh, well, that was successful. I'll also make this one. So if you want to see more historical movies, see All right. like pay to see historical movies when they come out. Very good advice. All right, I know we still have a couple more questions, and um, but uh, we want to be mindful of time, so I'm sorry that we cannot get to them all. I really am. <laughs> but um, so uh, thank you so much for being here, Jason. A lot of really great positive feedback for your talk today. Um, so very excited about that. <clears throat> um,